Once again, it's been a while. I'm back. Just can't quit you. My hair's grown out a little bit. Still not gonna fix my hair for you people, no matter how long it is. Hello again, and welcome to episode number 22 of Sex in the Watchtower, where I honestly cannot believe we are still talking about this subject. I mean, there's plenty of recycled material to deal with, don't get me wrong, but that's because the witnesses keep recycling it. <laughs> there's a lot of repetition when you're a witness because, well, that's one of the basic tools of brainwashing, so. Anyhow, as always, this video contains explicit subject matter and is not appropriate for work, school, bedtime, bath time, really any time, honestly. It's definitely not appropriate for kids. Cats apparently can tolerate it. You can see they have grown quite a bit. No, she does not like to be held, but we need to see her. See how pretty her ears. Huge and beautiful. Just do us all a favor and put your headphones on. Today, we're going to look at some older material from the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. As you'll see, they took a very different and, dare I say, more strident tone back then. Our first article today is from the Watchtower in 1964, and it's called How the Organization Should View Chasteness. Now, once again, I need to point out to you that this was a study article, meaning that it was read aloud in public to the whole congregation and anyone who had the misfortune of visiting that Sunday. And then the questions in small print at the bottom of the page were read and people raised their hands to give an answer, including small children and your great grandma. Just keep that in mind as we explore this gem of a study question. How is human sex to be viewed and why so? Well, I mean, I guess it could be most easily viewed on your computer. They didn't really have computers at home in 1964, so. I don't know. They couldn't really view the porn at home at all because they didn't have VCRs then either. Maybe human sex was best viewed through a crack in the door or like, I, I, don't, I don't know. How do people get their porn in 1964? Why are they asking this question at the Sunday meeting? I'm, I'm, I'm very uncomfortable. Chasteness takes sex into account. What? How do you figure? In the light of God's holy word, sex is sacred. Sex did not spring from blind, unintelligent, unmoral, accidental evolution operating towards a selfish end human sex as well as the sex of animals fish birds insects and plants is of god is god immoral because he created sex no oh this is a lot wow why would anyone automatically assume that all sex is immoral and therefore god must be immoral for creating it? my which he clearly did not because he doesn't exist but let's try to stay on topic here i seem to recall a lot of rape in the bible how in the world could these people read the actual bible and still say that it presents a view that sex is sacred i mean what the fuck he did not purpose the great wave of sex madness that is sweeping the world resulting in all kinds of terrible social diseases or unhealth The use of purpose as a verb here is rather archaic and annoying to me. But I thought God was supposed to be omnipotent, omniscient, etc., etc. So shouldn't he have at least seen the great sex tsunami coming? Even if he didn't actually intend for it to happen? And, and how can an omniscient being be surprised by anything? Whoops, I literally know everything and I'm all powerful, but mm, didn't mean for that to happen. Hmm. He purposed that sex should serve a miraculous purpose, that of propagating life in its various forms on earth, including human life. You know, I feel like, at least from a Jehovah's Witness view, it would have been a lot easier and less messy if God had just propagated humans the same way one would propagate plants. You know, like take a clipping and put it in some water or some dirt till it starts growing a new plant. Or you could like graft parts of parent plants together, make a new one. Eh, okay, maybe not. This is kind of starting to sound a little Frankensteinish on second thought. Okay, let's ask a study question. In harmony with this, what purpose were the sex organs to serve? And why is there a sacred aspect about them? The sex organs are to serve the purpose of procreation, period. Nothing else. Not peeing, guys, so you're sinners from the word go, and definitely not pleasure. <laughs> Especially if you're female. That's just wrong. Now, as for the sacred aspect, I, I got nothing. I mean, in all my years as a witness, I didn't see much that was sacred, especially not any part of the human body. The male sex organs and the female sex organs were to cooperate in fulfilling this God-given command. Oh. Yeah, apparently your sex organs are sentient and are capable of working together to fulfill the commands of a silent, invisible deity. I mean, 
to hell with your consent and what you want to do with your life, submit. Thus, the sex organs are not playthings to have a lot of fun with, for such fun does not serve the divine purpose. So does this mean they're allowed to have a little bit of fun with them, but just not too much? But wait, if, if fun sex doesn't serve the divine purpose, then why the hell does it exist? Unless orgasm was another divine oopsie or something, like another thing he just didn't see coming. Oh, look! It results in injury, not alone to the sex organs, but to the whole individual who tries to have fun in this way. My! What? How? W what kind of kink are they into? Look, I've had my share of fun sex, y'all, and it has never resulted in an injury to my organs. Just saying. The sex organs, rather than being toys, serve a most serious purpose. For that reason, the sex organs, male and female, have a sacred aspect or way of being looked at. They have to do with life, especially the life of a coming generation of humans. Don't play with it, you heathen. Hands off! It's not supposed to be fun, and it's not supposed to feel good. If it does, you are a sinner, and you need to be ashamed of yourself. I am also very curious about the sacred way you should look at sex organs. I mean, are you supposed to perform some sort of ceremony before you look at them, or... Do you need to look at it with a mirror as if you're peeking at Medusa? Or do you, do you have to wear like special garments and sacrifice a burnt offering or something? I mean, what? Clearly, we are only allowed to think about making babies when we have sex. That is the only purpose for it after all. The only one. Is not life to begin with a gift from God? And is it therefore not sacred? Yeah, I guess. But why is it worded like this? Theoretically, the earth is also a gift from God. If you believe in this nonsense, it shouldn't it also be sacred? Doesn't stop us from plowing it though, does it? The life of every human creature now breathing the air is considered to be sacred. <sighs> really? Are the lives of serial killers sacred? What about apostates? Gotcha, witnesses. Here comes some real crazy shit. Is not the life of the coming generation also to be considered sacred? It is. Remember the sixth and seventh of the Ten Commandments as given by God to his prophet Moses for the nation of Israel. You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. Do you want to kill or even cripple the coming generation? A baby? A child? Why? You can do so by tampering with the sex organs, by using them in a way contrary to God's purpose and law regarding them, hence in an immoral way that produces loathsome diseases that affect human offspring fatally. What the actual fuck are they even trying to say? Let's try to follow the logic here. Life is sacred, so you shouldn't murder anything. Not sure why adultery has anything to do with it, but okay, whatever. I mean, nobody actually dies from adultery, except those people on 48 Hours and Forensics Files, and technically they died because someone killed them and not because of the actual sex, but I digress. Do you want to kill or even cripple the coming generation? Babies? Children? Who would answer yes to this question? And how does it have anything to do at all with the preceding paragraph? Did you notice that the way they worded this actually implies that being crippled or handicapped is worse than being killed? <laughs> Y'all, are they, are they saying here that you can accidentally murder babies by tampering with sex organs? I mean, not the baby's sex organs, you sicko. They're saying that if you have sex outside marriage, you will produce loathsome, sexually transmitted diseases that will kill and maim babies. I, I'm, I'm not following. These people need a biology lesson. Look, sexually transmitted diseases are not actually generated by having sex. You know that, right? They are transmitted through sex, but they are not a punishment for sin that's visited on people by God. STDs do not spontaneously occur just in general. In order for someone to catch an STD from their partner, their partner, now follow me here, has to already have it. Also, many STDs these days are completely preventable with protection and treatable well before the point of causing damage to an unborn baby. And guess what? A baby is not actually conceived from every single sex act. In fact, most human sex does not result in conception, so this whole perfectly created system is really pretty inefficient. Now, the next few paragraphs of this article are about why abortion is wrong and how women have owners and how Orientals, especially Koreans, date their age from the time of conception rather than the time of birth. I'm skipping forward to the Oriental Asian. It's Asian part because it's eh, problematic.
quite consistently with this fact, some Orientals, like Koreans, date their age in life from the time of their being conceived in the womb of their mothers, not from the day of their birth. This points up the fact that human the human embryo is a living creature and should not be destroyed at any stage. Well, okay, but but what if what if the fetus doesn't actually have a brain? What if it doesn't have a skull or has some other abnormality that re renders it unable to survive outside the womb? What then? What if its birth would threaten the life of the mother? Which life is more sacred? That's too gray. Too gray. Back, back to the black and white thinking, please. But let's talk about the Koreans for a second. Because what Watchtower has said here is not technically true according to my research, which involves talking to some actual Koreans. First of all, it is not really possible to pinpoint ex the exact day of conception, usually. Fertilization doesn't actually always happen the same day as intercourse, guys, since sperm can survive for up to five days inside a woman's body. I know it's pretty gross, but it's true. She could actually ovulate a few days after having sex and the actual conception would not happen until then. There is something in Korean culture called the 100th day celebration in the life of an infant. It's called baek il. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. This tradition stems from the global fact of high inf infant mortality in olden days. The 100th day of a child's life was considered critical because if they survived to that point, they were more likely to survive into childhood and later adulthood. There's also a cultural thing in Korea where everyone turns a year older on the same day, New Year's, instead of their actual birthday. Now, none of this actually points to dating their age from the time of conception or anything else that Watchtower's trying to sell here. Correspondingly, the life-giving seed in a male should not be willfully misused. Oh boy, here we go. Recall the case of Onan, the son of the patriarch Judah. He refused to perform his duty to provide a male heir for his dead brother Ur. Who names their kid Ur? They just like run out of ideas? By having sex relations with the childless widow, Tamar. So did he actually refuse to have sex with her or did he just pull out? What I heard was, I heard he just pulled out. But even if he did refuse to have sex with her, I mean, why is that wrong? They weren't married to each other and maybe he found her horribly unattractive and he just couldn't get the, the little soldier to attention? And what was the expectation for this as far as like timing goes? I mean, was he expected to jump on it and knock her up like right then, like five minutes after his brother died? Were they supposed to like do it once and hope for the best? Or was there like an expectation that they would do it until they procreated? If that was the case, maybe he really was into her and maybe he was cheating a little so he could keep trying. <laughs> I've got I've got far too many questions here is is what it boils down to. Yeah. God killed Onan, not just for this unbrotherly conduct, but because the reproductive seed that should have given life to an heir for his dead brother was purposely spilled upon the ground. Well, if there was reproductive seed involved, he must have done it. Look, this whole situation is still grody to the max, but I don't understand why God would have to kill him for it. Okay, I know there was a law about brothers having to impreg impregnate a dead brother's wife if he died before doing it himself, but honestly, that's barbaric and contrary to God's other law about only having sex with the person you're married to. Also, who's responsible then for taking care of those children? Who's gonna feed them? I just cannot imagine if this was actually still considered a thing today. It would be yet another reason for me to be profoundly glad that Mr. Fister successfully fathered our two boys. For sure. Also, this particular Bible story has often been used as the basis for condemnation of masturbation, as some have assumed that Onan didn't actually pull out, but jerked off instead. If that was the case, I don't really see how that would matter. It's not like he couldn't just wait a little while and still do the thing. I mean... For this, Onan deserved greater punishment than to have the widowed Tamar draw a sandal off his foot and spit in his face and say before elderly witnesses, that is the way it should be done to the man who will not build up his brother's household. This story just keeps getting weirder. I mean, why would she take one of his shoes off? Why only one? What, what's with the spitting? I mean, that seems like very unhygienic and also immature. What do the elderly witnesses have to do with anything? Damn, I wouldn't want to sleep with her either if I were him. Especially not with all these elderly witnesses looking on. I mean, that's just... Mm, performance anxiety. On the other hand, no man should engage in sexual immorality and start another human life that he does not want because it will be an illegitimate life. Honey, no. That's what condoms are for, sweetheart. Also, I thought all life was sacred. If that's the case, then how could any life be illegitimate? 
because it is illegitimate, he purposes to abandon the child and never own it or confess the fact that he is the father of the illegitimate child. Such a course shows no respect for human life, for the life of a helpless infant. Wait a second. That's not always the case. I mean, sure, there's plenty of cases where a bastard child is abandoned, but there's also many cases where the wayward parent actually does provide for and care for the extramarital offspring. This is fear-mongering at its finest, and it's really, really shitty. Just use condoms, y'all. No diseases, no unwanted pregnancies, problem solved. Okay, I know they fail sometimes, so if you're going to do it, you have to be prepared to, you know, deal with the consequences or whatever. But, but for real, condoms. When is the indulging in sexual intercourse a sinning against the participant's own body? Um... I guess when there's no consent given, I, maybe, when it's rape? Hmm, but then it wouldn't be indulging exactly, would it? I mean, I guess that would depend on which elders were on your judicial committee once someone found out about it. Everyone who commits sexual immorality not only breaks God's law against adultery and fornication, but sins against his own body, a fact that is plainly stated by Paul in 1 Corinthians 6.18. Let's look up the scripture. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin that a man may commit is outside his body, but whoever practices sexual immorality is sinning against his own body. Okay, so it says that, but it doesn't say why. I guess it's because technically two people's bodies are briefly joined during sex. I think this is also the reason behind the becoming one flesh thing, too. But look, y'all, you don't actually become the same person when you have sex. You aren't inextricably linked for life. It doesn't change your genetic makeup or your personality or anything about who you are when you have sex. I still don't understand how having sex is sinning against your own body. I mean, I think all the bodies involved enjoyed it very much. Thank you. <laughs> Princess Andromeda is taking a snack break. I don't know how she got so fat eating this way. Get it, girl. This is how she eats. Oh yeah, that's good stuff. When sexual union is affected in a legal scriptural marriage, it is not a breaking of God's law or a sinning against the married person's body. It is in harmony with God's command to the first human male and female in their physical perfection and innocence. Y'all. This sexual legalese is killing me. How exactly does one affect sexual union in a legal scriptural marriage? Are there like forms to fill out? Is there a manual or something? I mean, are there actual legal motions that need to be filed here? <laughs> and how exactly did this work for Adam and Eve, that first human male and female in their physical perfection and innocence? Because I don't actually recall a first wedding ceremony anywhere in the book of Genesis, so... Weren't they technically already out of compliance with the scriptural legal marriage code? The Christian letter to the Hebrews says, Let marriage be honorable among all, and the marriage bed be without defilement, for God will judge fornicators and adulterers. It is the conduct of the adulterers and fornicators in sinning against their own bodies that brings about the ghastly social diseases, and that thus perverts the divine purpose, degrading the sex organs that God created for such high purposes, and that he clothes with such importance and dignity. Oh! I know we already said this, but... Let me repeat it for the people in the back. Having sex, whether you are married or not, does not create STDs in and of itself. In order for an STD to be involved, someone had to have it before the sex took place because if they didn't, they wouldn't have been able to pass it on to their partner, capiche? <laughs> I would also argue that a true divine purpose all the way from the almighty omnipotent creator of the universe could not be perverted by consenting adults doing what their hormones prompt them to do. I also don't understand how they figure that God clothes sex organs with such importance and dignity. I mean, he didn't provide Adam and Eve with any clothing. They had to make their own, as I recall. And he demanded that the natural clothing that comes with a new penis be chopped off. So I'm not sure this makes any sense whatsoever. Consequently, can you not be glad that your parents lived morally clean both before and after their marriage? Making a lot of assumptions there, Watchtower. Can you imagine being in the audience at this Watchtower study if you actually knew that your parents weren't married when you were born or if, if you knew that one of your parents was a cheater? Mm, no fun. Or more realistically, why the hell would your parents' sexual behavior matter to you, regardless of their marital status at the time, if you hadn't been brainwashed in exactly this way? I, for one, never wanted to know the details about my parents and their sex lives. Ugh, I was told far more than I ever wanted to hear at a young age, and I still don't want to know. Wish I could erase that.
Um, yeah, let's change the subject. Originally, legal marriage was the natural outlook that God set before men and women. Well, as I said, I do not remember a wedding anywhere in Genesis. I mean, where'd they find a justice of the peace in Eden? Every human has the right to lead a clean life in anticipation of an honorable marriage. Conditions apply. Only if you're planning to marry someone of the opposite sex and the same race, depending on where you live, and also the same religion. Otherwise, you're SOL, my friend. No person has the right to pollute his fellow creature who has such a God-given prerogative by forcing sexual immorality upon his fellow creature or by tempting him into it. No selfish person has a right to spoil the privilege and prospects of a fellow creature to an honorable, happy, healthy marriage. This is creepy as fuck. Seriously, his fellow creature? <laughs> to me, this smacks of bestiality just a little bit. I mean, why not say fellow person? Another person, literally anything but fellow creature. And if premarital sex was really so awful and so harmful, how would it be possible to tempt someone into it? <laughs> no one has a right to prevent another from having such a desirable marriage by misusing the sex organs or processes of that one. We should respect the bodies of other persons as well as our own. It's really, really twisted. I mean... They've explained what they mean by misusing sex organs. Kinda. But what the hell do they mean by processes here? Also, virginity and happy marriage are not actually related to each other. I mean, you're not automatically going to be blissfully happy in your marriage and sexually fulfilled just because you never got it on beforehand. Quite the contrary actually and the opposite also holds true that is just because you have a little experience before you walk down the aisle it doesn't mean you have no chance of having a happy healthy marriage but that seems to be what they're applying what they're implying here and furthermore i don't know where they get off talking about respecting the bodies of other persons when the jehovah's witnesses absolutely do not do this respecting someone else's body would also mean accepting boundaries it would be not nitpicking someone's dress and grooming and appearance to the astonishing degree that they do. It would mean not asking invasive, rude, and inappropriate questions in judicial meetings and beyond. Did I mention that these people are twisted as fuck? Well, hang on to your ass, kid, because it's about to get real crazy. Hence, no Christian girl should make herself like a public towel on which any man can wipe his hands by means of immorality. Oh, my. Oh, no, they didn't. What self-respecting man who believes in health and hygiene would want to wipe his hand on a dirty public towel by marrying a girl who makes a harlot of herself, a prostitute? I see. So it's not the male who's the dirty slut. He can choose to wipe his dirty hands on her, but the dirt stays with her and not him. Man, fuck you assholes. Guess what? A female cannot be a harlot or a prostitute or a slut or any other shamey term related to having sexuality without the assistance or insistence of some dude. Girls, do not make yourselves a dirty towel for public use available to the dirty hands of any whoremonger or any symbolic dog. Ma, Are you picking up the blatant misogyny here? In the black and white, all or nothing way the scenario is presented, girls... If you are sexual in any way, even if you just finally give in to your Jehovah's Witness boyfriend's insistence, you are a dirty whore, a dirty public towel, and your boyfriend is being advised not to marry you now. Nice, isn't it? Because after all, if you'll do it at all, you'll do it with any old whoremonger or dog who comes bebopping through the neighborhood after all. This is absolutely disgusting. We should honor our sexual parts. How exactly? Because we know it's not by looking at them or touching them, obviously. And we all know what happens if we wear tight pants, short skirts, or low-cut blouses. So how exactly is this honor to be expressed? Said Paul to the Corinthian Christians, the parts of the body which we think to be less honorable, these we surround with more abundant honor. And so our unseemly parts have the more abundant comeliness, whereas our comely parts do not need anything. Wait, 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 wait. So are they saying that like tits and ass are not as comely or are somehow dishonorable, so that's why we have to honor them. <laughs> this is bizarre. Bizarre, y'all. Oh, I'm dying. Until the oncoming battle of Armageddon and the binding and abyssing of Satan the devil and his demons, God will let immorality prevail and increase on the earth, according to the debased desires of worldly sinners. Why would he do this? Seriously, this, this doesn't make any sense. 
but fornicators, adulterers, sodomites, and lesbians will not survive into God's righteous new order. But didn't God supposedly create all these same people? I mean, I, I get that fornicators and adulterers are breaking rules, but gay people are just being gay. I mean, they're just being people. They're excluded from the righteous new order because of who they are, not exactly because of their behavior. How is that fair? And furthermore, fornication, if fornication is such a big deal, then why did God make it so much fun? Marriage of the human sexes was purposed by God the Creator and set up by Him to serve a happy purpose, that of filling a paradise earth with a healthy, righteous race of perfect men and women. Yeah, I did miss the part in the Bible about the signing of that first marriage license. But according to an article in The Week, the first recorded marriage took place in 2350 BC in Mesopotamia. Before that, humans had loose family groups with several men and several women that all sort of shared. Yep, we had herds like horses or, you know, packs like dogs or something. <laughs> Like it or not, human beings are animals who have created their own social frameworks, one of which is the idea of marriage between one woman and one man as the only correct way. I also think the use of the word race here is interesting. Race refers to a group that humans divide ourselves into based on common physical traits among people of the same ancestry. So what exactly are they trying to say here? It was our creator who designed and arranged all our life processes. So, like, God designed infection too, huh? According to his will, all our normal life processes were made to be happy and healthy. Happy digestion and excretion, everyone! This includes the important sexual union for conceiving children to expand the human family and fill all the earth with human creatures in God's image and likeness. Is it just me, or does God sound like a total narcissist? I mean, who wants to create a whole world full of mini-me's? According to the way in which God made the male and the female, their obedience to this command to fill the earth with their kind was not to be a hardship to them, a burden to them. It was to be a pleasant, delightful procedure. My, my, my. Wait, childbirth wasn't supposed to be a hardship? Clearly this was written by a man. A delightful procedure? <laughs> Wow, because <laughs> clearly they are not considering any part of the process except the part where they shoot their wad. The writer here does not care about any of the rest of the process, starting with ovulation or pregnancy or childbirth or postpartum recovery. Nope, he only cares about intercourse because that's the part that he physically participates in. Jerk. One that contributed unspeakable happiness to living and serving God. Unspeakable unspeakably happy because witnesses don't really want you to have any happiness to speak of. But by whom was this to be enjoyed? By married people, by those whom God had joined together. Somehow or other, prior to 2350 BC. By those who through honorable legal marriage should become one flesh and stay that way. That's right. Once you're married, you're stuck. Don't go thinking you can do whatever's best for you or what makes you happy. Screw you. Legality is the most important thing. Those who try to enjoy the ecstasies of sexual union outside the marriage bond dishonor God, disobey him. And as we all know, the utmost thought in the minds of anyone trying to enjoy the ecstasies of sexual union is whether or not they are obeying the silent invisible deity that they've been told is watching them at all times. Let's do another study question, shall we? What helps us to overcome <laughs> animal passions? therapy mostly. Why are the sex organs not to be worshipped? Because only Watchtower, I mean Jehovah, should be worshipped. Though the instruction to honor your sex organs in the earlier paragraph is certainly confusing in this context. This in no way means that we should worship the sex organs and engage in phallic worship, committing immorality as a religious privilege and obligation. <laughs> because clearly phallic worship would be the only option here. I mean the penis is the only sex organ that matters after all. No one would worship female parts, would they? The sex organs are not to be worshipped, even in one's mind, by one's constantly or primarily thinking on sexual parts and activities. Do not think about sex. Don't think about it at all. You're thinking about it. I can tell. Stop it. The sex organs did not give life to the human family. But yeah, yeah they did. Wait, they literally did. They are only the marvelous means by which life is to be transmitted to our children according to God's will. Um, no. 
our children do not exist without being literally grown within our sexual organs, specifically a female uterus. It's not like children are just sitting there waiting for us to bestow life upon them with our gen genitals. I just picture somebody with, with a penis like a sword. I dub thee, sir. That's just fucked up. God the Creator is the sacred source of life. But don't get confused here. It's God the Creator. Not God the real estate agent or God the truck driver. Make sure you get it right. He alone is the one to be worshipped as the giver of life to mankind and the giver of the reproductive organs for the increase of the human family. Sex worship is therefore idolatry. Wait, we've been talking about sex worship for a few minutes here, and I'm wondering why exactly. How did we make the leap here? Naturally, it leads to moral uncleanness. By all means, avoid it. Oh, by all means. <laughs> all right, so let's recap this article thus far. God created sex. But you can't do it unless you're legally, 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 like legally married. And it shouldn't be fun either. Sex is for making righteous white babies. While you should certainly honor the comely penis, you should by all means avoid idolizing dicks. Especially the governing body. How to keep pure. Chaste. So there's a whole bunch of waxing poetic about how great the Jehovah's Witnesses are. So I'm, I'm going to skip right to the really silly part. If you want to read all the bullshit, feel free to look up the article yourself. It ill befits us, therefore, to abuse our God-given physical powers for transmitting life to offspring by immoral conduct between the sexes. What are we, superheroes now? Such conduct may result in an illegitimate, unauthorized offspring as a living witness to its parents' shameful secret conduct or in a foul social disease. Oh. Why? Unauthorized offspring? <laughs> what? Who authorizes offspring? Is there, like, some bureau of procreation authorization somewhere and again with the social diseases i'm telling you somebody has to have it in the first place before they can transmit it okay but certainly it will result in the condemnation by the pure-minded creator who made the male and female for an honorable happy purpose if anyone abides under his condemnation it means being deprived of eternal life for having abused life and the power to transmit life okay i think we need to bring in a translator here if you have sex God's going to smite you, and you're going to die at Armageddon. But wait. Okay, if sex is for procreation, and that is its only intended purpose, then why is the Watchtower so head up about unauthorized, illegitimate births? I mean, they procreated, and if God didn't want them to, maybe, maybe, he should have considered the efficiency of his creation before he pushed it into production. And another thing. I am not sure that I actually would want to live forever with a bunch of red tape addicted legalistic bureaucratic poindexters who suck all the joy out of life. I'll take Armageddon, thanks anyway. To help us get out of uncleanness and stay out of it, we need to make God our model or standard of purity or chasteness. I'm not sure that's the best idea, actually. God himself had a son out of wedlock, you know. Tell me he didn't. Jesus was illegitimate, my friends. Don't believe me? Where was his mama? I mean, before Mary. He supposedly existed a long time before he went to earth. So where's his mama? Where's Jehovah's wife? I want to see the marriage certificate. If there isn't one, then he's a fornicator and he needs to be disfellowshipped. Someone call the elders. And speaking of Mary, she was like 14. I've never heard a word to convince me that she ever gave consent to being impregnated by Yahweh. So at the very least, he's guilty of statutory rape there. And I would argue he's also guilty of child abuse considering what he ultimately allowed to happen to Jesus. There's gotta be some kind of neglect at the very least. So they're telling us to imitate someone who can't follow his own rules, who date rapes minors and neglects and abuses his kids. Right. Newborn infant boys and girls do not know what sex is about. They have no unclean sexual desires. So we're supposed to be like babies? Um, not sure we know what desires babies have. Unclean or otherwise, since they can't talk. But keep in mind that they do try to put literally everything in their mouth. So, <laughs> but seriously, this is weird as hell. We're supposed to be babies that don't understand sex while simultaneously being adults who do understand sex. 
I mean, it seems like they're saying we need to be completely sexless without desire of any kind until and unless we are authorized by the marriage department and then only for the purposes of procreation. But we should know about sex in a detached, dispassionate, clinical way. And just, ew. Hence the Apostle Peter says that Christians should put away all moral badness. We should become like newborn infants as to innocence in this regard. We should be full-grown men and women as to understanding what sex is about and as to our moral self-control. Time for a moment with magic. Consequently, we need to have mental hygiene as well as physical hygiene. Among the ancient Jews under Jehovah's law through Moses, the circumcision of the flesh of the males proved to be very hygienic and helped to safeguard the health of both male and female Jews. Okay, I think I need some citations here. I'm not at all sure that circumcision was actually done for anyone's health. Especially in ancient times, sterile conditions did not actually exist anywhere. I'm also confused about why God, in his infinite wisdom and all that, would create humans supposedly in his image with the foreskin and then demand that they chop it off. Another unanticipated oopsie from the divine creator, perhaps? I don't know. Christians who have been relieved of this law of circumcision do, however, have to practice the circumcision of the heart. Well, that sounds awful. No way am I letting anybody chop pieces off of me. You can forget it. It is the part of heavenly wisdom for us to strive to keep the New World Society of Jehovah's Witnesses clean and chaste. Because sex is dirty, kids. Very, very dirty. The results of this continual striving in that direction are becoming manifest all the time under God's blessing. As regards ancient Israel, their observance of Jehovah's laws and commandments made them the healthiest nation on earth, free from the many social diseases that plague the pagan or Gentile nations. Again, I'm gonna need a citation here. How do we know they were the healthiest nation on earth? And, and I'm not buying that there was no VD in ancient Israel. I'm just, I, I'm just not. Correspondingly, our endeavors to keep the organization of God's public servants clean, pure, and chaste should result not only in keeping us doctrinally pure, but also in making us the healthiest society on earth, such especially as to social diseases. Well, I mean, I guess if you never have sex, then you can't get VD unless you get herpes from a toilet seat or something. Isn't this the best advertising hook, though? Become a Jehovah's Witness. We don't have VD. But there are a few other things that are worth looking at here. First of all, Jehovah's Witnesses are not public servants. They are not. They don't perform any type of public service at all. They don't feed the homeless. They don't operate hospitals or charities. They don't even donate to charity. They don't serve in the military or as police officers. They don't adopt a highway and pick up trash or scrub graffiti off public property. They do literally nothing that could be considered public service. Also, I don't know if you've noticed, but they are definitely not the healthiest society on earth. The average congregation I was in was rife with illness, especially among the bored, unhappy, and intellectually stunted sisters. Issues with obesity abounded for both men and women. There were all sorts of mental illnesses ranging from depression and anxiety to pseudo suicidal ideation and narcissism. We had more than one schizophrenic in my congregation growing up, too. I'm just saying, I've heard that since I left, all the sisters somehow came down with fibromyalgia, too. If you're looking up this article, then you know I've left out a whole bunch of paragraphs dealing with spiritual chasteness because, well, that's not really what this series is about. But basically, it seems to me that they're trying to compare being a Jehovah's Witness to being married and having beliefs outside the authorized Jehovah's Witness doctrine being the same as adultery. Yuck. Do we desire the great judge Jehovah God to bear witness against us individually as being like adulterers? That is morally unclean, unchaste? Oh! But wait, who's he bearing witness to? I I'm not sure I understand how this court works. If he has the evidence against us on this score, he will unfailingly cause his witness or testimony against us to be made known in his time, and this will lead to our being put out of his new world society of his witnesses, that our presence might not defile it. Okay, so if God somehow has evidence that we're either not towing the Jehovah's Witness party line or haven't accepted the new light or whatever, or that we've had sexual thoughts not involving an authorized spousal unit, he's going to put it all on blast to who now? And we're going to get disfellowshipped? However, do we with all our heart desire to remain in that new world society for God's public service? Uh, no. Since our obvious answer is a fervent yes. Dude, I said no then we will each one do his part toward keeping it pure, chaste, to his praise and in behalf of our precious public service to him. What public service? Y'all don't do any public service. 
Anyway, this means that in addition to brainwashing yourself out of any sexuality whatsoever, you must also do your part toward keeping the organization pure and chaste and clean by reporting on everyone you know if you see, imagine, dream, or otherwise suspect that they might have done something wrong. Well, I think that's quite enough procreative insanity for today. Tune in next time when we delve further into the past sexual deviance, repression of the Jehovah's Witnesses. Until then, I'm Sister Fister, and this is crazy.